Hey guys, my name is Parker Lee and I'm the Creative Media Associate here at Starkville First United Methodist Church and I'm so grateful that you have joined us for this recap video of the first 12 chapters of Luke. Now let's start at the basics. Who is Luke? Well, we know Luke to be the companion to Paul. Paul writes about him in his letter to Colossians. As Pastor Charlie told us last week, Luke may have been Paul's personal doctor going along with him on his adventures, keeping him well, keeping him healthy. But we know Luke to be educated, as we hope most doctors are. They're a little bit more educated, which puts him probably in a little bit of a higher social class. But he doesn't look down on lower social classes. We see this through his writing. A lot of his writing is about Jesus's relationships with people and relationships in general. And the Gospel of Luke, as we know it, is actually part one of a two-part letter written to this person named Theophilus. The second part of the letter is what we know as Acts. Here in the modern times, we've stuck the Gospel of John right in the middle, but originally it was written as Luke-Acts. So, yeah. But it's written to this guy named Theophilus. Now, who is Theophilus? We don't really know. <laughs> As Pastor Charlie told us last week, he may have been the guy who's bankrolling Paul's adventures. Because just as now, back then, it cost money to go places. And you couldn't just go willy-nilly across the Mediterranean, so there's probably someone giving them money to support them financially. Uh, another theory is that Theophilus is a friend. Maybe he's a Roman statesman who's learned about Jesus. But I sit in one of the camps that thinks that Theophilus isn't a real person. I think Theophilus is, as translated, a lover of God. I think Theophilus is kind of this euphemism for people, Christians. And uh, there's really no right or wrong answer. We don't know who Theophilus is, but the reasoning for me is Luke starts this account with, I want you to I want to write down all these things from eyewitnesses so that you could be certain about what you have already learned about Jesus. Now, why would Luke want to go talk to eyewitnesses? Well, cuz headlines lie. Look at our world today. <laughs> Look at the last year. And Luke wanted to go talk to the people who had seen it firsthand. You see, because the thing about the culture, most people in that time were illiterate. They couldn't write. But most towns had a storyteller, either an official one or an unofficial one, and they would tell the tales of the town. Now these aren't like the Odysseys or your favorite weekly soap opera. These are literally the stories of the town. Family stories, if you will. Kind of like how there are stories in your family that you all know the ending of. But there is one person who tells that story right, and they are the official storyteller of the potato casserole ca catastrophe of 2005. They are the only ones allowed to tell it just because they tell it right. Not because they're the only one who knows it, but they tell it right. And that's how many of the towns were back then. There were people who knew the stories of the town and they just told it best. But at that time, and the historian and theologian N.T. Wright who's probably the leading theologian on the first century AD Christianity in that world, puts this kind of in the early, mid-60s, 60s, 60s AD. Um, and at that time, there's a war raging. You see, by 70 AD, Jerusalem has been destroyed. A lot of those communities that saw firsthand accounts of Jesus and his miracles were disbanded and broken up. So Luke is literally in a race against time to go and find these stories to write them down for history. But Luke actually doesn't start off his letter with Jesus at all. You see, he starts off his letter of Luke about a story about an old man and an old woman. We hear the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah was an older man. He was a priest in the temple in Jerusalem. His wife, Elizabeth, was older, but she was barren. They had no children. But Luke says in his gospel that they were righteous in the eyes of God. Sound familiar? It should. There are clear parallels here between 
the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth and Abraham and Sarah, who were also righteous in the eyes of God. And from them and their faith came Isaac. Now, Isaac is the one who all of Israel can trace their lineage back to. Out of Isaac came all of the Jewish people. That's huge. And by using this parallel and seeing this parallel, Luke is telling us a very clear story that God's about to do something on that level again. But this child was not the Messiah. You see, at that time, you know, even before 70 AD when Jerusalem is destroyed, we're in the somewhere between BC and 80, kind of three to five years BC kind of time period. Rome was the ruler of the land. And under Rome was a king named Herod. And the Jewish people wanted nothing more than to be on their own because Herod was not their king. He was a puppet king from Rome. They wanted to be free. But if this baby of Elizabeth and Zechariah, John, was not to be the Messiah, well, how would this happen? Chapter 2 tells us about the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem and how it came to be. Because you see, when they arrived that night, there were no available rooms. Because you see, Mary and Joseph were from Nazareth, which is up in the north. But Bethlehem is kind of down here in the south, so it's a long journey for them. Mary being seven, eight months pregnant at the time probably slowed them down. So by the time they got to Bethlehem, it was the middle of the night. There are no more rooms available. It's not like today where you can call ahead and make a reservation, like Trivago it, like that's just not a thing. And so when they arrived, there is no room. So they found the only spot they could, a stable with some animals. Now, let's remember this, right? I want to come back to this of how this whole situation happened. But from there, we hear the story of the shepherds out in the field. It's the middle of the night, watching their sheep, just make sure they're not getting eaten by lions or whatever hunts in Israel. When all of a sudden, angels appear to these shepherds. And they tell them, go look for the Messiah. He will be here in Bethlehem. You will find him in a stable. Well, once the shepherds kind of got over the fact of, did you see that? I saw that. Okay, we both saw that. Okay, it wasn't something we ate. Well, now they got to go find the Messiah. And they find him just as he is described. But let's take a time out and step back. Put yourself into their shoes. You are Jewish. You want nothing more than to be your own people again out from under the Roman Empire. How would you do it? Well, you'd probably send a king probably athletic warrior, probably royal, but you would not send a baby to be born in a stable, literally laying in a feeding trough among animals in the middle of the night. That's backwards. And that's on purpose. You see, Luke is showing us just how backwards God's plan is. He's putting a magnifying glass to it. See, God does not use the most powerful people in center stage of his plan. He uses the lowliest. He uses the people who are faithful and willing. Now, that's not to say that the Roman Empire is not critical to the story, because that's where I want to dive in. Without the Roman Empire, there is no way that Jesus would have been born in Bethlehem. But God does use them, but they're not center stage. Center stage is a teenage girl who is pregnant and the father of her child is not who is going to be her husband. We have an old woman who is childless and barren. We have shepherds who are kind of the outcasts of their society. They are not the cool people. They were just the kind of migrants. But God uses them. Now from here we go on and hear about some pretty amazing stories and as Charlie alluded to last week, a lot of these stories are subtitled, if you have subtitles, of Jesus heals. Again, Luke was a doctor, so of course his thing is healing. He's amazed by people healing. And last week, um, Charlie pointed this out and kind of asked you this question of, notice how Jesus talks to his disciples. Jesus is often sending his disciples out to go and do. 
What does that say about our lives? But I want to spend the remainder of our time, and I want to deep dive into this idea of God using the Roman Empire to fulfill his prophecy. Because you see, I feel like a lot of us believe that God can use us. We believe that. On a micro level, we believe that God can use us to change our life and the life of our community. We believe that God can change our community. And we believe that this is possible, but I feel like we draw a line at God using the government. Like, we don't understand, like, well, how does that work? But he did it. He used the Roman government. Because God uses people to make big changes. Now, you see, the prophet Micah lived about 700 years before Jesus and John. So, 700 BC. And he wrote this, and I want to read it to you because I want to get it right. But you, O Bethlehem, who is one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. 700 years before Jesus was on the scene, that was written. 700 years ago from today, the Canterbury Tales were written. Like, that is amazing. And this comes to us from a minor prophet, Micah. Not minor because he's insignificant. We just don't have that much of his writing. Some of the major prophets were just really wordy. So Micah tells us this 700 years before Jesus comes around. But let's remember back to chapter 1. Rome was literally the thing that people wanted to destroy and get out of their lives to get their freedom back. But God used them. Do you believe God can use you? Do you think there's something in your life that God can use? Or is there something in your life that you're holding back from God that, man, there's no way God can use this? Why are you writing this off? Why do you think God can't use this? You think just because you've done a bad thing, God can't use you? Man, welcome to the club if you've done bad things. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But God still uses People. I mean, look throughout the entire Bible to find examples of this. David was said to be a man after God's own heart, yet he had an affair and killed the husband. Elizabeth, from our story earlier in Luke, was barren. Jonah ran away from God. Paul literally killed people, Christians, and God used him to write two-thirds of our New Testament. Thomas, the disciple, lived with Jesus for three years, saw his ministry firsthand, time after time, day after day, and did not believe that Jesus could get up from the tomb until he saw it himself. The disciples saw not once, but at least twice that we know of, over 4,000 men plus their families be fed just from a couple loaves of bread and some fish and have leftovers. Lazarus was literally dead. Not dead like clear, but like dead, starting to smell in his tomb when Jesus told him to get up and walk out. But I hear you, I, I, I hear you. You're saying, God can't use me, I've messed up, I've done this horrible thing, I have no right to tell people how to live their lives. To which my rebuttal is, well, who better to tell me that the stove is hot than the one who just burned their hand on it? You see, your life is your testimony and God wants to use it if you'll let him. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's painful even. But God can use you. You see, on my wrist, I wear a wristband and it says more. And it's just a one word thing from Ephesians, Ephesians 3.20. For God is capable of immeasurably more, more than you can dream, more than you can imagine, more than you can ask. And he does all of this not by pushing us around, but by his spirit deep within us. Now, I want to pause for a minute. I'm, I'm sure this wasn't what you were expecting, but I want you just to take one minute with me. Don't pause this video. Don't exit the video. Stick with me. Focus in right here. Pray with me for 60 seconds. What is it inside of you that God can use for his glory? What are you holding on to that you think God can't use this? Let's think about it. Just pray about it. Just 60 seconds. I've got a clock. I'll keep the time. Let's pray about what God can use in your life.
thank you so much for sticking with us. I know this may not have been what you're expecting, and I know I may have been a little bit uncomfortable, but man, let me tell you, I believe there's truth in this book, and I believe there's life-changing truth that you can find, but you can't shy away from it. Man, I know this was stepping all over my toes this week, but there are things that I needed to be reminded of, and that God can use things in my life, no matter how big, how small. But man, I just want to say I am so grateful and so thankful for you being able to read with us through Luke. I hope you'll read the second half of Luke with us. This week you're going to read the third account of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, his death, and ultimately his resurrection. And as you read that, I want to leave you with how Luke opened this book, his dedication to Theophilus. Since I have investigated all the reports in close detail, starting from the story's beginning, I decided to write it all out for you, the most honorable Theophilus, lover of God, so you can know beyond the shadow of a doubt the reliability of what you were taught.